Well, hello, I'm here with Caitlin and Doug and Urban to talk about various technical things, including Wiz. But it looks like we're starting with Caitlin. Why, thank you, Sam. And today I have a very special book for everyone. <laughs> it is Quantum Information for Babies. So last week we did Quantum Computers for Babies. And now we're going to do Quantum Information for Babies by Chris Ferry. Oh, Sam, you look so excited. Quantum information uh, is different than quantum computers? It is. Although you'll see a lot of the same concepts. Well, th this one I agree with. That is a ball. Yes. This Once is I a ball. Place. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is a ball. Yeah. I think this is some misinformation. No, it's it's all true. This ball can be red or blue. <gasps> Look at that. And you see one side's red and one side is blue. That's not the same thing as red or blue, but anyway. We need one bit of information to record the color of this ball. So you could say if it if a number is zero, it could be red. And if it's one, it's blue. All right. We need two bits of information to record the color of two balls. So you could imagine the same thing again. And look, there's two balls and they're half red, half blue. Yeah. But look at this. Computers can store many bits of information. How many bits of information do you think they can store, Sam? Maybe three. Oh, that yeah, they could do three. Do you think maybe they could do more than three? Not unless they're expensive. <laughs> maybe. Irvin, how many bits do you think a computer can hold? I mean, it's very binary, so one. I think it's a little more than that. Look Thank at this. You. This phone can store one million bits of information, which is actually a very tame phone. <laughs> I thought a million would be more dots than that. I yeah, but but there's a lot of dots. That a looks lot like of about dots. Twenty. All right. It, it, you're not. It's not the. It's not the round dots. It's the printer ink dots mm. that are the million dots that just look like big balls in the end. So, this is an electron. And you see, it has a what? What letter is this? I think it's Internet Explorer. It. it yeah. E. E is for Explorer, and E is for electron. Uh -huh. And there's a little. A little bar here. That means negative because electrons have a negative charge. Uh -huh. <laughs> An electron is a quantum ball. That's the woke electron. Yeah, it's very woke. <laughs> it's Born in uh, California. Yeah, it's gonna. It's 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 in the closet still. So you know, the electron stores a quantum bit of information. So it's just like the balls could be red or blue. This stores. This electron stores a quantum bit of information. Let's see what a quantum bit is. A quantum bit is called a qubit. And look at that. It's the electron, and it stores a qubit. If two bits are needed to describe... Oh, if two bits are needed to describe one qubit, then four bits are needed to describe two qubits ah, this is really going way wrong now <laughs> but here's where it gets interesting and 16 bits are needed to describe four qubits oh man so here's we have 16 bits over here four qubits all did these the, bits did the all these bits to put their name on this because i i would want to take my name off of this book at this point but go ahead <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> This phone can store one million bits, remember? Yeah. All those bits, not more than three bits, a million bits. Yeah. And it, but it can store 20 qubits of information. So you could store a million bits in 20 qubits. Oh, man. Isn't that cool? 21 qubits, you would need two <laughs> phones. So you double the amount of information what? every single qubit you add. What kind of idiot wrote this? They don't know what they're talking about. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> they don't know the difference between a qubit and a bit. This is appalling. <laughs> but 22 qubits would need four phones. No. 
No, 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 that's not how it works. We can use quantum systems to store quantum information. No, no. We are. Are you? Do you? What? What? What is? What is your issue with this quantum, sentence, Sam? There's no such thing as quantum information. There's just information. <laughs> this, this whoever made this has no idea what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> To store the information in this molecule, you would, would take all the phones on Earth. So this is a big molecule, and I assume this these is carbon over here, and so it's probably not hydrogen. As if, not as if oh, no, wait, no, wait. This is carbon. Carb the, the yellow is carbon. Yes. Yeah, and so then oxygen. is more information than a whole phone. It's not like the phone is made of atoms and molecules or anything. It would take all the phones on Earth to store all the information in that molecule. Man, <laughs> oh man, that's the worst of all the books you've done. <laughs> Everything after what? half is just totally wrong. <laughs> what took all the phones in the world can be done with a single molecule. What in the hell? And all the atoms. We're switching from electrons to atoms for from atoms to or yeah, we're switching from electrons to atoms for some reason. But all these atoms can store more information than all the phones in the world. Like hell. <laughs> Makes no sense at all. One day quantum computers might replace all this, all the computers. So so what kind of computer is this, Sam? A computer with a baseball or basketball. Yep. And there's a, what kind of computer is this? That one's on fire and covering with smoke. Yeah, a smoke computer. And what is this? Does this look like a computer, the yellow one? It's a cell phone that's been left out in the sun and faded. Yeah. Do you think cell phones are computers? Yes. But I think so, too. Computers. No, not yet. Yeah. But well, now you know quantum information. Now you know which that. I am highly skeptical about. Yes. Yeah. The whole <laughs> man, they should have not published that book anyway. No, no, that was that was pretty bad. <laughs> I'm highly skeptical. Yeah. Um anyways, uh I mean I wonder how much no, you can't store that much information in the wave function of you of can an store atom. In principle, an infinite amount, depending on the precision with which you measure the wave function. But that's the noise, and qubits have a lot of noise. Yes. So, it's 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 a bit like radio. I mean, technically, you could, if you had perfect signal to noise ratio, right. send a lot of data. You're never going to get it. And when you're talking about quantum information, it's like even worse. Than that. Well, you know, I was <laughs> reading this, and now to get error correct, they they have like six times as many qubits combining to reduce errors and the error rate goes down to like 30%. So it's really mm -hmm. awful. The qubits have a yeah. lot of noise. <laughs> they yes. really don't contain much information at all right now because they're too noisy. Exactly. I mean, in, in principle, yeah, all our, all our internet speeds could be, you know, 1 trillion bits per second. And, but in reality, in practice, it, there's there's some hard limits. <laughs> yeah, the qubits are analog. That's the thing. So a little bit of a noise. And so realistically, modern but, qubits seem to contain about four or eight bits. That's about it. But but so are like our Ethernet cables. People don't realize yep. this. But the way Ethernet cables work is it's not like a pulse up and down. It yeah. is actually just using, you know, standard, you know, sine waves and modulating the sine waves as it goes through the wires and stuff like that. So. And DSL does too. Anyway. Yep, DSL. Yeah. You're, wait, who's still using DSL? Oh, lots of people. Oh. Okay. I feel sorry for them or for people using DSL. Okay. Uh anyway. <laughs> let, let's do some real news. Um <laughs> Business Insider uh has an article by who wrote this? Eugene Kim. Now, this is sort of close to my heart because Tomorrow is my first day going into the office. So I have been remote. So the group I'm on was remote before the pandemic. And then I joined during the pandemic and no one in the office or no one in my group goes into my office. And my, my, um, the group I'm in is 
international. So even if we did all go in, there would only be like three mm -hmm. of us in the area. So there's just no point of going in. But finally, I was like, and I made this choice myself. I decided it would be good for me to go into the office once in a while and just interact with people. <laughs> like it, there is, there is some benefit to that. So um, tomorrow I'm going in. Uh, and uh, it, there's a lot of people though, that are being forced to go back to the office. Um, I have the choice. Luckily, a lot of people don't. Um, and what some people have done is they do something called coffee badging, which basically means that they go into the office, they scan their badge to pick up coffee and then leave because the coffee is free at, at Amazon. You scan your badge, you get coffee. It's awesome. And uh they're trying to make it so like you have to stay between two to six hours a day if you return to office and you know people like you are a professional right like you i i get why sometimes it's it's bs that your boss is making you go to work when you can do the work at home just fine and you're not getting much value i get it i get it but you are a professional if your boss says go into the office for six hours you know, a day, three days a week, just do it. And keep in mind, I know no one who's going in like every single day. Well, actually, I know a few people that go in most days, but they're they're rare. Most people are like hybrid, which is good. I, I, I support hybrid, 100%. Well, I think one thing that happened is a bunch of people moved away during the pandemic and thought they could stay remote forever. And were often even promised they could stay remote forever. And so they're really complaining about being forced back into the office. Yeah, those people are not these people. These people are going in to the office, tagging and leaving. So they're obviously close enough to get in. Yeah. Well, the um, the other thing I've heard is that if you do go to the office, there's nobody there. You're just sitting in your office on Zoom. <laughs> so it's kind of pointless. Yeah. So the days I, I specifically am not going to go in are my meetings days. Yeah. So I have certain days where I just am in a bunch of meetings. Yeah. And those days I stay at home, which you would think would be the opposite, but everyone is all over the place. So it, I'd be in Zoom meetings in the office, which is silly. Well, you know, I think if you're going to make people come in, there ought to be something happening that's special that requires them to be there. I take the same attitude towards my classes. If they're just watching a lecture, there's no reason for them not to just tune in on Zoom or Twitch. So the, the reason why I am going in is because I, I had an assignment, and I'm not going to mention on the podcast what it was, but I had to go into the office because I was working on hardware. Yeah. And while I was working on hardware... I um, was overhearing conversations my coworkers were having about security uh, and they weren't security professionals. So I was able to come over and be like, here's how we do things and here's the things you need to know. And that's when I realized there's actually just benefits just to sitting in the office, you know, and just being a resource for other people and other people being a resource for you yeah. and just, you know, and, and that's it. I mean, there's, there's, that's the near and far of my decision. Yeah, if there's people at your director that make sense, like right now I'm in Texas at this teacher's convention, there's 100 teachers all here physically, and it's really nice. You get a better yeah. connection, really meeting people physically and attending class physically. Exactly. And like I said, I, I, I'm I, still remote. I'm still partially remote. I mm -hmm. don't think there's, I don't think that going full return to office is a good idea. Uh, but if we're going to be honest, there is some benefits to meeting okay. in, in the office once in a while, so... Oh, sure. All right. Well, uh, I was very entertained by this one. You know, Disney got hacked. They dumped about a terabyte of information. They got in their Discord. They leaked the scripts of upcoming things, the stills, the proposed new things, all kinds of stuff they didn't want to make public. And it happened because there was an outside hacker group and they had an inside man helping them. And then they reached a point where the inside man refused to keep helping them. So they betrayed him and dumped out all his information, not just his name so he can get fired, but his credit card number, his social security number, and all his personal details too. So, you know, it's as if criminals are just bad people. And even when you're helping them, they aren't grateful like they should be. So, uh, and what do you got, Irvin? Oh, I got, I got a first look at the layout of the new password manager coming to everything I, all the Apple stuff, mm -hmm. how to sort and sync and all little screenshots of their password manager. So is it any different than other password managers? And by the way, they've had something like in the cloud, some kind of keychain in the cloud. Isn't it the same thing? Uh, it is the upgraded version of that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is archaic. 
and old, and now they're bringing in something fresh and new to compete with everything else that exists. You know, there was a guy who broke into a cryptocurrency wallet because they used automatically generated passwords from a password manager, and it was insecure. So I wonder if they used a good random number generator. Oh, well, we're going to find out. Yeah, I bet Apple did. Yeah. Apple's pretty smart about that kind of thing. That's yeah, just what just what I wanted. My password managers and all my passwords and login tied to Apple devices. So I can't use it on Windows. I mean, who's or in Linux? Windows anyways. That's a good point. Is it going to sync with other operating systems? Probably not at first. Well, no. Of course not. Of course so not. you just have to abandon this nonsense of owning anything that didn't come from Apple. That's yeah, yes. I mean, that, that is just nonsense anyway. So what are you talking about? Evidently, okay. I remember back in the old I, days when Microsoft would not admit that any other company existed. They would rub the Apple off their map and you couldn't mention, they wanted to pretend they were the only company on earth. And I guess Apple's trying that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this would be a good time to mention Bitwarden, which is a password manager that is open source. Or now. Is, is secure. Or now, um, or now and yes. Free and multi-platform. And free and multi-platform, right. And it just goes yeah. in your browser, it throws your passwords, and just make sure you have a different password on every single site you go to. Because the way you get hacked is you reuse passwords. Well, now it's all supposed to be pass keys, I'll have you know which I've heard so many terrible things about. Apparently, if you make pass keys, you can't fit enough on a USB stick and they're not compatible and all kinds of awful things happen. But supposedly they were going to replace passwords. <laughs> I'm telling you, um, Bitwarden yeah. is, is a godsend. So. Yeah, I think for practicality, that's it. Well, okay, what have you got, Doug? So, <clears throat> not sure if anybody's following this, but Rite Aid is in the news. Yeah. So I don't know. Is this was just released, but it's pretty incredible. Rite Aid had stolen data, including customer names, addresses, birth dates, driver's license numbers, and it looks like this is from twenty two point two million customers. At least that's what the reporting so far. And uh, we've got mandatory reporting in Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, and Oregon. And it was associated with purchases of retail products between June 6, 2017 and July 30th, 2018. So here's the question I have if is why? <laughs> yeah. So they said on June 6, 2024, an unknown third party impersonated a company employee to compromise their business credentials and gain access to certain business systems. Now, and they only got old data? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, that's what it sounds like. That's pretty screwy. Maybe they so, got old backup or something. Maybe, but Rite Aid was proud to announce that we detected the incident within 12 hours and immediately launched an internal investigation. So well, that's not bad. No, it's that's not, not bad at all. And I guess they didn't get medical information, they didn't get all the drugs, drugs people were buying or anything. So it's not that sensitive. It's, well, driver's license. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it depends how you want to do, you know, what you want to call that. Birth like, dates, driver's license numbers. It sounds like information that's already been out in other breaches. Oh, probably. Yeah. And besides, yeah, yeah I don't know. And what are they going to do with that? They're going to send you a spam and somehow convince you more because they know your driver's license number. I'm not quite seeing how it's really going to help. Well, well, you you can... the, the iOS password manager instead of Bitwarden. Wait, what are we? I said, I they'll scam you into using oh. the iOS password manager instead of Bitwarden. Oh, that's what Rite Aid is using? And which one would you prefer? Bitwarden, right? Over Apple? You know, I, I can't say. Oh, okay. I haven't tried the other one. Got to find out. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, I haven't tried them either. Well, all right, Caitlin, why don't you go on to the next one? 
as soon as I unmute myself. Absolutely. Okay. So the first article I did was near and dear to my heart. And so is the second article. So I recently got a uh, one of these things, which is a uh, iPad, the new iPad, or the M4 chip. And it's awesome. I mean, it's a, it's a computer. And OK, it's not showing my notifications good. It's it's a full computer. I mean, it has an M4 chip, 16 gigs of RAM, um, and I need to do real work on it. And I can't, really. Um, I, I found a few workarounds, uh, but finally the workarounds are coming to the App Store. Uh, so let me share my browser. Um, Tom's Hardware has an article by Jeff but I said, but so Jeff Butts uh, has this article here um, about the first PC emulator. Uh, and it is an emulator. So it's virtualization software called UTM. But because Apple's uh, store essentially does not allow just in time compiling uh, for their apps, even though Apple itself uses JIT just in time compiling for their own first party stuff, they just don't allow third parties to use it, which is infuriating yeah. uh you can emulate uh, various systems using utm so it's utm se standing for slow edition it's now on the app store and you can run um you know arch linux or windows xp or whatever this old stuff or slow stuff uh, stuff that doesn't require a lot of speed but it runs and so now you can fully turn your uh, you can start turning the the iPad into something that's halfway usable. You can get a, a real command prompt and update software with like Pac-Man and run like Ubuntu and Windows XP and maybe even Kali if you're brave enough. Uh, but, uh, you know, Apple really needs to make this happen. Like everyone was complaining that they don't have Mac OS for these new iPads. And, and I understand why not. I mean, it's, but... The, these are not toys anymore, right? The days of the iPad being a $300 little toy that you get um, is over. These are running desktops, grade processors. They are worth thousands of dollars. You spend thousand dollars on them. They're designed with productivity in mind. Um, and for whatever reason, Apple is just now saying, okay, yeah, we'll let your virtualization, emulation, come on, you know, get onto the store. And it's, and Apple really needs to get, you know, allow certain people, certain trusted developers uh, to be able to use a uh, JIT recompiling so we can get full virtualization on the iPad. I bet the Europeans are going to force them to. The Europeans already forced them to let other people use the hardware uh, crypto storage. So. Yeah. And I think, I think some of their loosening of the, of their, App Store was because of the things that Europe was doing. They said, you got to let a alternate Play Store on. And what were people mostly using the alternate stores for, you know, getting emulators and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, now, unfortunately, getting JIT working on uh, an iPad is a little bit more complicated than just getting the alt store or getting an alt store right. uh, running. Uh, and unfortunately, right now, the the bypass to enable JIT on the new iPads is still not working. Um, it, you basically get a developer account and then you sort of unlock it for this app. And um, I mean, it's not like a full jailbreak, uh, but you have to sort of enable JIT for the application through like a side loading process. Still not fully working on the on the new iPad yet. So it sounds but, like a Microsoft Surface would be a better buy than an iPad. Maybe, but I will say that I do like the touch first design of, of iPad OS, mm -hmm. like for 99, for 90% 90 of what I want to do, I want to be an iPad OS and I want to use, I actually do want to use Apple's iStore and, you know, use, use, you know, a touch first system. The problem is, is that once in a while I do have, I do want to use it for real work. And that requires, at least in my line of work, being able to run virtual machines. Yeah. A lot of virtual machines, and there's enough RAM. There's 16 gigs of RAM in here. Um, it doesn't have to be Mac OS. You know, Linux is fine. But like, uh, there are two things. One, I need to be able to run 
vir uh, virtualization software and two i should not need another computer to develop on the ipad i should be able to do ipad development on the ipad yeah and apple just refuses to treat their one thousand seven hundred dollar computer like it's a computer still which yep. is too bad that's apple for you yep yep all right well, I got an article uh, here, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, if you're in a cryptocurrency space, there are so many North Korean hackers with fake resumes applying for all the jobs that it's very hard to hire anybody anymore. You'll get a fake North Korean persona who will work at your company and steal your stuff. So uh, it's a thing to be aware of. Yet another problem in the hiring process. And they so claim they worked in $600 million this way so far. So say this again. Uh, when you uh, when you're applying, when you're hiring people, all these North Koreans make fake resumes and apply, and then try to work remote. And then once they get in, of course, they steal your secrets and pass it on and steal your stuff. And so somehow you have to filter out all these undesirable fake applicants from the real people applying for your job. And it's not clear. So, so what you're saying is it's sort of a denial of service attack, yeah. except yeah. if they get hired, yeah. then it becomes outright theft. Yep. And this is Got what you said about when you expanded to China, the Chinese government would force you to hire local people who they would then force to steal your secrets and give it to them. Yeah. So it was pretty nasty. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, Irvin, what, what do you got? Oh, yeah, this one I saw. Kaspersky. Yes. Kaspersky is sadly leaving the U.S. It is well, they got kicked out by the Biden administration. <laughs> yeah, it is a day of mourning for poor Kaspersky. So, uh, mm -hmm. as they are leaving, they're giving out some free security products for six months. And you won't be able to get the update after, I think, September, according to the government. <laughs> Well, so yeah, they won't be, have to be nuts to them. use that. <laughs> I mean, some free some free antivirus for a little bit. Yeah, so you can give Putin root on your machine. Exactly. Think of all the benefits. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't think they're going to have too many takers for that. I mean, that's a... Oh, well. Oh, well. Have you got another one, Doug? I think you do, right? I do. So this is from Marketplace Tech. And this is a very interesting court case involving the Supreme Court and freedom of speech. So this case went to the Supreme Court, but the high court kicked it back to the lower courts. But this is kind of interesting because they added some commentary about what they think they would rule had they actually ruled upon it. And what they're essentially saying is, Private companies, Meta, Twitter, have a First Amendment right of censorship. That's what they said. Like, if they want to kick off Trump or something, they should be allowed to do that because they're a private company and they're not right. obligated to provide speech to everybody. They can just have whatever their own editorial standards are. Yeah. So, again, this isn't a ruling. It's been sent back to the lower courts for additional information or additional ruling. But they kind of leaked out that that's the way that they will roll, should it come back to them. That's what all the experts I've heard have always said. Private companies, like you could put a sign in your restaurant, we can deny service to anyone. In a private club, you can have whatever rules you want. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it, I, I mean, <laughs> doesn't seem fair, but what in the world is fair? Well, the U.S. Wait. government is not allowed to discriminate. That's where it's fair. But private companies yeah. are to a large extent. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah. So, so Doug, if, if you set up a website and you have a comment section, yeah. Or do you think you shouldn't be able to moderate that comment section? I mean, uh, that's an interesting way of putting it. And I think you're um, even required to. If people put up like dangerous misinformation, like telling people bad medical facts, and you don't take it down, I think you might be liable. Well, here, so let, before we go down that path, look, if somebody puts up child porn, you're right. Yeah. You have a you have a duty um, of censorship down. there. Yeah. Now, so, security covers you a lot. Right, right, right. That's why it's an issue. Yeah. Certain web properties are immune from prosecution 
for user created content, but exactly what the rules are for that has never been determined, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, so go ahead. So it's it's really dangerous when the government does try to censor, but it's it's specifically the government, right? You have a right on whatever platform you have uh, to allow people or not allow people on your personal platform. It's just when the government decides, you know, who has the right to free speech and who doesn't, is there a, you know, civil rights issue? Um, yeah. So here's the question. Can the government suggest or advise? Apparently so. There was a lawsuit that's actually apparently so. Yep. They stopped the government from telling people about that. Oh, and Sam's just, out of the game here. What am I? What? Uh, uh, he's in Texas, so the power probably just went out. No, you uh, guys can't see. It looks good here. I'm out. I'm gone. What? Well, this is strange. Oh, you're all frozen. Oh, well, all right. I'm going to have to end it.